Thank you, very, <clears throat> thank you very much, Peter. It's a real privilege to be part of the Golden Jubilee for the Institute. Um, this is going to be a slightly strange experience. I kind of envy the two previous speakers because quite a lot of my source material is actually sitting down there in the audience. Um, so unusual. Um, I want to look at the role of the medical profession in contraception and family planning in Ireland. There's been very little done on this. Um, and I think there's, there, there is a real story to be told here, and that's more or less the outline. I'm going to try and get a lot done in a relatively short period. I think one of the points we must realise is that, that family planning represented a major challenge for the profession in Ireland. A, in the years before the Institute was established, contraception had featured only marginally in the work of the medical profession, both in Ireland and indeed elsewhere. The NHS, for example, only engages with family planning in 1967. So it's all happening outside the medical profession by and large, though there are some individual exceptions to that. In the 60s and 70s, however, family planning becomes a critical and quite divisive issue for obstetricians and GPs. The medical profession played a major role in expanding information and access to contraception, though the profession was, as I've said, deeply divided on the issue. Doctors were often caught between the various stakeholders, women, second wave feminism, government, the Catholic Church, and indeed other health service providers, notably the pharmacies, though I'm not going to talk about them today. Contraception was also the first major challenge presented by patients to the authority and expertise of the medical profession. As such, it's the forerunner of a lot of the current healthcare debates, and I think worth thinking about in those terms, where the voices of consumers and patient groups often challenge medical expertise and authority. Some of the story I'm telling here represents what happens elsewhere, but a lot of it is actually specific to Ireland, and we have to focus accordingly. Uh, as I've said, I've set out the, the, the outline here, and I want to start with the whole question of fertility decline and why Ireland is different. Fertility decline begins in late 18th century France, and a lot of it takes place throughout the developed world, what we now call the developed world, in the 19th century. There's a very significant fall in fertility, and it's all happening without any medical intervention. Uh, the main methods were abstinence or coitus interruptus, perhaps abortion, that's debatable. Research in Britain in the earlier 20th century by Schrader and F Fisher, done mainly for oral histories, uh, older people, shows that the initiative and responsibility for most fertility decline rested with men, and it was achieved when the husband was careful. Uh, there are questions like we need to ask about Irish men in that context as well. Condoms played a very limited role until well after World War II. Mary Stopes clinics were forerunners, but they're of marginal significance, not least because diaphragms demanded bathrooms and other facilities that were uncommon well into the 1950s. In Ireland, we place an awful lot of emphasis on the 1935 Act, which prohibited the sale, distribution, and manufacture of contraceptives. Nobody really uh, remarks on the fact that similar legislation existed in France until 1967. Madame de Gaulle was very annoyed when it was repealed. Uh, it also existed in many European countries and in very large swathes of the United States. Uh, condoms, however, might be available on a limited extent as disease preventatives. The 1935 Act, I would argue, really only becomes important in Ireland in the mid-late 1960s. <clears throat> what is much more important to my mind is the 1929 Censorship of Publications Act, because it means that there's no information or discussion about contraception within Ireland. Uh, it, it was very rigorous in its banning. It banned things like Paris Encyclopedia that might discuss this, good housekeeping manuals of family health, incredibly wide swathe of material. Uh, the work done in Princeton suggests the first stage in fertility limita limitation is for people to believe that this is a possibility. When they decide it's a possibility and when they work out that they would like to do it, they then find means of doing it. The means comes later. Initially, the Netherlands, Britain, Quebec, United States, and many other places, the Catholic Church permitted and indeed encouraged the knowledge of the safe period. And some doctors were involved in promoting it, often with the support and in conjunction with the church. In Ireland, however, where the Catholic Church had a monopoly, they felt no need to provide any family planning advice, uh, 
uh, until the 1970s, and by this time, the pill and family planning clinics are already well established. While the calendar method was by no sense a reliable form of contraception, the neurologist John Marshall, who would have been well known in Ireland and was a, an active member of the Catholic Marriage Advisory Council in Britain, he was also a member of the Papal Commission on Birth Control. Anyway, John Marshall estimated that 80% of women having regular unprotected sex would become pregnant within a year. If they used the calendar method, it would fall to 25%. Not not particularly reliable, but in terms of global fertility decline, quite significant. In 1961, the Irish birth rate was very close to the European average, but this was achieved in a very, very strange way. It was achieved unique factors. One quarter of adults in Ireland didn't marry at this stage, and nor were they particularly sexually active. The mean age of marriage in Ireland is 29. It's about 22, 23 elsewhere in the Western world at this time. Ireland is the latest in Europe. And those who married, however, had very large families. Uh, the Dublin Corporation housing list, you wanted to get on to the 1960s, they would tell you you needed a minimum of four children. If you wanted to get up the housing ladder, the advice was go and have another child. So I'll leave you to imagine the consequence of that. Marital, marital fertility in Ireland, this is, as you can see here, is seriously is number one in the world by a mile. Uh, New Zealand is number two. As you can see, it's almost double England and Wales. And out of this, you get the Irish contribution to gynecology and obstetrics, the, the grand, the grand multipara, high priority mothers, major medical problem. And you also get some physiotomy that Peter and myself have dealt with together. Um, so, this is really the background to the medical profession and fertility limitation in Ireland. Uh, Philip Larkin memorably said that, 1960, that sexual intercourse began, began in 1963. I would argue that family planning in Ireland probably began in 1963. It's the year when the pill was probably first prescribed. Somebody's going to come up and find a 1962 prescription, but it's not going to change the story. Uh, more importantly, the Fertility Guidance Clinic is opened in Hollis Street by the new master, Kieran O'Driscoll, uh, run mainly by Declan Marr. Uh, and Marno Driscoll claimed correctly that this was the very first such clinic in a maternity hospital anywhere in the world. James Clinch, who's in the audience, I'm delighted today, was involved in setting up a clinic in a maternity hospital in Cardiff, but that's later. It's after 67 when this becomes permissible under the NHS. Now, Hollow Street only provided advice initially on Catholic Church-approved methods. But let's not dismiss that. This is the first time that any public forum in Ireland is providing any basic information about fertility limitation and the safe period. The Catholic Church position in Ireland was that such instruction could only be given one-to-one, -one, doctor to patient. No pamphlets were available in Ireland at the time. A, by 1966, Hollis Street had had an estimated 20,000 women sitting in a lecture or two, these were postnatal, on the safe period. That's 20,000 people who know something that had not been known in Ireland before, even if it's very, very basic information. Declan Marr recalled only one question from all these audiences. One woman asked him how many children he had. Um, Hollow Street used literature produced by the Catholic Marriage Advisory Council and shows you how dedicated the censorship and the postal authorities were. A large batch posted to Declan Marr was actually confiscated by a zealous a po postal official and he had to go and prove that it should be given back to him. This is CM, Catholic Marriage Advisory Council stuff. In the same year also, the, Guild, the Catholic Guild of St. Cosmos and Damien organized a course for its members on family planning. It got a lecture from, I can't remember the name of the man, he was a gynecologist in Northern Ireland, and also they got Bertie Crow in to do the ethical ex examples of it. And they then, with the approval of John Charles McQuaid, produced a booklet based on that seminar, but the booklet would only be available to doctors. Uh, there was a suggestion maybe they could provide it to the general public, and they were told certainly not. I might also note, before this, Michael Solomons had opened a clinic in Dr. Stevens. He deliberately opened it there rather than the Rotunda because he felt that nice people wouldn't, nice families wouldn't send their doc daughters for training in the Rotunda if they knew that there was a family planning clinic on offer there. Um, so what we're talking about now is information becoming 
more widely available. It's still restricted, but it's coming out. Not that doctors knew much about it. I mean, this is a quote from Austin Dara about a, a, the, amount, the education that doctors had on fertility limitation at the time. There's a similar one somewhere from David Nolan, the Irish Times uh, consultant, or the Irish Times medical correspondent, which I need to kind of fish out somewhere. By 1966, um, things are really taking off. The numbers turning up in Hollow Street looking for advice is really zooming. They've had to restrict the clinic to a very selective category. Those women who've given birth in the hospital, who have serious medical conditions, who have high fertility, distressing socioeconomic problems, women under 30 with five children, but of those that they targeted to come for one-to-one -one consultation, only 30% are showing up. They're actually sending follow-up letters. They're getting onto reminders and everything. They're not showing up, which suggests a fatalistic attitude towards their condition and towards childbirth. They're also beginning to prescribe the pill by them. Um, in 1967, over... over 100 doctors attended a session at the IMA conference, which, which was addressed by Declan Maher and by Professor McClure Brown of the Hammersmith Hospital. And Syntex ran a press conference at the conference a, and an information session. I must add that many doctors objected to both the Declan Maher presentation and to the Syntex uh, conference. The pill is really important for Ireland because it's the first form of contraception that comes available, but for women all over the world, it's the first really reliable contraception. It transforms contraception worldwide. It takes the initiative from men to women. It's only available on prescription, so it puts doctors into pole position. It also changes the doctor-patient relationship in a remarkable way. This is the first time that healthy women are walking into a doctor's surgery and saying, give me a prescription for the pill. It's the beginning of a much more consumer attitude. It's much more uh, patient-led demands in medicine for the very first time. And you get magazines such as Women's Choice. This is an Irish magazine, 1971. Lots of letters from women asking, can you suggest a doctor who will prescribe the pill? Women saying they can't go to the family doctor, they're too embarrassed, they've known him since they were kids, uh, and all kinds of other distress and embarrassment when they go to a doctor who will not give it to them. The pill remains the number one form of contraception provided by the Irish Family Planning Clinics well into the 1980s, which doesn't make logical sense uh, because it was in theory available in every town in Ireland. But what it shows is that a lot of women are continue to be embarrassed about going to this figurehead of authority looking for a prescription. They're uncomfortable. They want to go to a stranger instead. A, a dear friend of ours who was a GP locum in rural Cavan in the 1970s is, was confident that every woman of childbearing, every married woman of childbearing years and, and one single woman of childbearing years turned up when he was doing locum in the two weeks demanding the pill. They were not prepared to do it with the regular doctor because, you know, he, they, they'd meet him in the shop the next day or something like that. The stranger was great. Humana Vitae is an absolute bombshell for the medical profession and John Bonner, who's here, can say an awful lot more about this than I can. Our Irish gynaecologists and Catholic gynaecologists more generally had inspected and indeed had been given advance suggestions that the Vatican was going to change its teaching quite significantly, but as we know, it didn't happen. Some doctors accepted the teaching, some sort of compromise, flexible definitions of medical causes and conscience, some rejected it entirely. Uh, Kieran O'Driscoll, Master of Hollis Street, issued a statement saying, as you can see there, the clinic closed. Uh, according to Connor Ward, the pediatrician, the Guild of St. Cosmos and Damien split on the issue, and that, that's coming through in some of the papers I found, never met again. And if any of you have the minutes somewhere uh, in your back, uh, you know, in the attic, could you get, give them to Harriet, please? I haven't been able to track them down, but Harriet would take good care of them. Uh, but there were objectors, and that's a list of 21 who came out very prominently objecting to, to the... To, to, to the whole uh, decision at the time. Uh, Ivor Brown, who was the first name on it, got, got a significant rap over the knuckles from John Charles McQuaid. Um, a poll in the 
A poll in the Irish Medical Times uh, in August 68 shows that of those that responded, uh, the overwhelming majority were in favour of legalising contraception, uh, but almost two-thirds were opposed to making them available only on prescription. They don't want to get involved with condoms. Um, but the Irish hospitals, maternity hospitals at this stage go kind of underground. The clinics either close or they go underground at the time. And as a consequence, World Medicine Journal described Ireland as a land of saints and hypocrites, claiming that doctors were refusing family planning advice in hospitals, but pre prescribing the pills in their private practice. The Rotunde ran a clinic, I know that, it's very low key, the reports which have been quite forthcoming up to then. They, they, you know, the whole thing is pulled back on that, and I need to find out more about their tundra. In the Coombe, James Clinch, as master, ran a clinic in the 70s that fitted IUDs, and he did it in the teeth of opposition from a lot of the midwives and ward sisters and the social worker, but he claims that he gradually gained their trust and they started sending him a women with serious medical and social problems. But the clinic closed when James Clinch his term as master ended. It shows you individuals can make a difference. A lot of the momentum at this stage, however, moves to family planning clinics, and doctors are still quite prominent in it. February 69, only about six months after Humana Vitae, the Fertility Guidance Clinic service opens in Merrion Street without publicity. Get some funding from Planned Parenthood. And it has a significant medical presence in its founding directors, as you can see there. It started off like Hollis Street to try to get to the Irish grand multipower, to get poor women with huge fam with large families. But it doesn't really work that way. Only 11 of the first 140 patients actually had medical cards. A lot of them were young and middle class. They moved to Mount Joy Square to see can they get more working class clients. They did up to a point. But the growing number of women going to the clinics were actually, as Eva, Emer Philip and Bowen shows, were actually single, and some of them weren't necessarily planning to get married any time soon. Uh, there were other doctors involved that I'll just mention in passing and different things. Derek Friedman sets up family planning services. I met him here one night at a dinner and got some papers that I was able to get into UCD archives as a consequence, which was great. Uh, Jim Lochran, GP, who was active in this and also in the Irish Family Planning Rights Association, which is a more a rights and lawyer lawyered group. And it was James Lochran, a GP to Mrs. McGee, who's involved in initiating the legal challenge that results in the 1973 Supreme Court judgment about the rights of a married couple to have access to contraception. And that, as you all know, creates a legal vacuum that enabled family planning clinics to open or expand and the emergence of mail order services, etc. And I want to look briefly at second wave feminism. Um, I often at this stage put up a picture of the contraceptive train and then start throwing things at it because it's a complete distortion of the whole story in my book. Contraception wasn't even listed among the goals of the Irish women's liberation movement when it was set up. They were a bit scared to do so. And I would argue that Students Union, initially Trinity and UCD, but later Galway and Limerick, were much more important in making contraception available. The spread of family planning clinics in Limerick and Galway was closely linked with the universities and university faculty, faculty wives, etc. Doctors were involved, but they weren't initiators. Cork is different. It was initiated by the remarkable gynecologist Edgar Ritchie, of whom more later. Well, Woman Clinic is the obvious manifestation of second wave feminist women's medicine in Dublin, founded in 1977 by former TCD Students' Union officer Anne Connolly. It's a clinic that is headed by a non-medic, and you know, this is an interesting change. It's a women's health clinic, medical uh, lay, lay, lay leadership, but it did employ a lot of doctors. Many, many doctors worked there. After one young doctor, I don't know whether it was male or female, was warned that they'd have to choose between the well woman and a career in obstetrics, they started favouring people who were going to go into general practice where this, this issue wouldn't arise. But I want to argue that the most significant feminist challenge to the Irish medical profession comes from an unlikely source. It's the billings or the ov ovulation method. Ireland is, I will argue, unique. The family planning only comes to Ireland, really, 
after the contraceptive pill has arrived. The pill arguably arrives before widespread natural family planning is available. Billings reached his Ireland around 1971. Some doctors were involved, notably Dr. Maeve Fitzgerald, anatomy lecturer in Galway, Dr. Ethna Bradley, GP in Donegal. Most teaching was conducted by women who weren't always medically trained, though midwives and nurses were active, and a lot of nuns, former missionary sisters, were also involved. Convents were the normal location of their clinics. The thing about it is that by 1977, these clinics are getting into parts of Ireland where there is no public discussion or information about family planning. Areas well away from a clinic, areas where you might find it difficult to get a doctor to prescribe the pill. Uh, as John Bonner pointed out, that the main advance was that it is women teaching women how to detect changes in their bodies. Uh, and it's demedicalizing the whole thing, escaping what, as he said, was the tyranny of the a thermometer. It is second wave feminism par excellence, though a lot of women, I think, feminists would, would kind of probably, you know, uh, lynch me for saying so. Uh, it's in the same mode as natural childbirth, self-examination of breasts, self-awareness of the bodies, ordinary women uh, defying the professoriate, the, the academy, and looking after their own uh, health records. Uh, Mavis Canary, who became the head of Naomi, which is a national organization for this method, criticized the IMA for supporting contraception. She claimed that for doctors, women subjected to the bondage of the contraceptive pill were a lucrative source of income. And John Bonner also explained that the reason why the ovulation method met with resistance from doctors was because the women could do it themselves on their own and didn't need constant visits to the surgery. He also concluded that women with more than 12 years education had the greatest difficulties in engaging with natural family planning. Farmers' wives and daughters were the best. But if it's women with more than 12 years education, I suspect that every woman in this room is in the kind of failed class on that basis. Um, I want to look at... A, 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 yeah, sorry, I, I should have given you that first. I want to now to look at a, a, some work carried out by Dr. Connor Carr, who's here this morning, and I've alerted him that he was going to be showing up on this slide. A, Connor Carr, consultant then, a, a, a former president of the Academy, consultant in Port Junkula, decided as a good clinician to work out whether the claims of this method stood the test of scrupulous research. Was it as easy to learn as, as it was claimed? Was it as successful? In 1976 paper in the Irish Medical Associate, Journal of the Irish Medical Associate, no, sorry, the Irish Medical Times, I think, he, he, he stated that to date the method has been conspicuous by two characteristics. Firstly, the enthusiasm of the promoters. Secondly, the almost complete lack of statistics on the clinic's results. So he carried out a trial, as you can see, 104 patients, mostly private patients. As note of 104, only 44 completed the charts, and six of them became pregnant within six months. Um, he, a, they go the, it goes through, three thought they were safe, one completely misunderstood the instructions, and two, th two thought they were apparently safe. Dr. Kevin Hume, who was a colleague of Billings, a, claimed that what Dr. Card did was an example of what not to do. The role of the physician should be limited to outlining the basic facts of male and female fertility and let the women get on with it. Dr. Carr took actually a lot of abuse in the media for, for this critical evaluation of the whole process. Now, the paradoxical thing about the ovulation method is that although it was led by women, it did in 1970s Ireland need the validation of male doctors. The journalist John Feeney noted that it was the support of Trinity Professor John Bonner, who's also with us today, it was his support that alerted the Catholic hierarchy to its existence. Women were doing it, so it was not, I mean, they're very slow at waking up to this particular momentum. And likewise, a, it was Dr. Bonner that alerted Charlie Hawhey and the Department of Health to this activity and got, got them interested. And when Naomi united all the regional branches in the country under one head, the president appointed was Arthur Barry, a retired Hollis Street consultant. I now move on, of course, inevitably, to the question of the government 
and the church, particularly the government at this point. The Irish government began to think about reforming the law on contraception around 1971. The main impetus at that stage, you'd be fascinated to hear, was not the Grand Montepara, but Northern Ireland and Northern Unionism. And, and that, if you read the early family planning debates, that's the number one agenda. And you can see grudging acknowledgement among civil servants and probably politicians you know, in around 71, 72, that yes, married couples should have the right to access whatever services they need. Uh, the government also accepted that the Supreme Court would probably rule in favour of Mrs. McGee. So that leaves you with the dilemma. You can look after married couples, make contraception accessible for them. How do you prevent moral rock the country going to wreck and ruin when contraception then spreads to every crossroad and to every teenager in the country? And the answer is very simple. You make the doctors the new moral policemen of Ireland. Um, in 1974, this in the context of one of Mary Robinson's bills, the IMA looked at it to see what role was being given to the doctors in it. And they come up with the statement that the doctors should not have to carry the can for prescribing all the family planning needs of the country, especially those that are non-medical. And they don't want the profession becoming the guardians of the moral conscience. Well, I wish them luck. I mean, this was, you know, a really naive aspiration on their part. Every piece of legislation up to the mid-1980s when Barry Desmond introduces his act puts the doctors in as moral policemen. There's the first draft of the government bill in 1974. That's the one that collapsed when, when you know, when Liam Cosgrave memorably voted against it, first draft by the AG Declan Costello, a put in a provision that every married couple would have to get a certificate from a doctor to say that they're married. And the doctor wouldn't be prescribing, he'd be merely certifying the status of the couple. Um, when Minister for Health Charlie Hohey met the IMA in 1978 to discuss the bill, they told him they wouldn't have anything to do with condoms. Noel O'Reilly, Secretary of the IMA, said the medical profession would not accept the role as arbiters of the moral conscience. Sounds the same again. Yet that is precisely what they did. The 79 Act prompted yet another wave of debate within the profession. Doctors were given the right to opt out. Some described prescribing condoms as demeaning. Many questioned restricting the access to single people. Nobody ever defines bona fide family planning. It's whatever way you want to define it yourself, and you can be quite elastic with it, I can assure you. Uh, and the doctors didn't welcome the pressure coming from Mr. Hawhey to promote natural methods. It's an interesting exchange when he meets them after it's been passed, it's the implementation phase, and he says to them that he acknowledges they don't like having to prescribe condoms, but he told them that as minister, he was required to undertake tasks that he didn't like as well, but it was part of his job as minister. And he said, similarly, authorizing condoms was part of the overall family planning service, which is surely a matter for doctors. It was widely speculated that the profession would refuse to cooperate with the Act, but that doesn't happen. I still haven't quite twigged why. I suspect it's because he puts the centrality of the family practitioner and the medical profession there, as opposed to disseminating the Royal among Health Boards and other agencies. Now, I want to move on to an area that has very little written about, which I think is really important, and this is the whole question of sterilisation. Sterilisation was never illegal in Ireland, Despite, and there are several government files that I've discovered, Peter Sids, that say this. Uh, when anybody tried to raise it with Mr. Hawhey in the discussion on the 79 uh, uh, Act, he said, no, it's legal, not to, we're not going there. It, it was, of course, contrary to Catholic teaching. Now, this is a very gendered story. By the mid-1970s, you could get vasectomy via local anaesthetic, so it could be done in doctor surgeries, family planning clinics. It was relatively cheap, it was private, it was a matter between the doctor and the patient. Not so female sterilization. There were female sterilizations done by gynecologists in acute medical circumstances. We obviously will never know the number. John Bonner, who again is here, has described to me, shortly after arriving in Dublin, he performed a tubal ligation in the rotunda on a woman who was suffering from serious heart failure and who was having a cesarean section. The master of Hollow Street, Derm MacDonald, performed the first tubal ligation in Hollow Street in somewhere in the years 76 to 78, I'll narrow it down. Despite, and he did it in the teeth of opposition from 
board members and nursing and, and some medical colleagues. He told his wife that they might have to emigrate to Canada as a consequence, and she was very supportive, and I've actually heard her say that in my presence. Uh, his colleague, Eamon de Valera, said to him after he'd done it, why hadn't he carried out a hysterectomy? And one question I would like to present to some of the older gynecologists in this, in this room is how many hysterectomies were carried out in this country as a form of, of female sterilization. The Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Ryan, who was chair of the board, um, did, to his credit, reject approaches from members of the Hollow Street board and some of the staff to censure Dr. MacDonald. Uh, but Dr. Ryan very cleverly acted to prevent this becoming a widespread practice. He issued a directive in 77 that ethical committees should be established in all the voluntary hospitals. Now, the involvement of these ethics committees does raise serious questions about doctor-patient relationships, patient confidentiality, and a doctor's capacity to make clinical decisions in the patient's interest. But it also leads to a very paradoxical role in Ireland because when it comes to family planning, clinics and other services, provincial Ireland was way behind. There were large sections of Ireland where you couldn't even get a pharmacist in the mid-1980s to prescribe condoms. I, there, are, there are maps of that that I have. I don't have time to go into it now. But when it comes to sterilization, the position is very, very different. What you can see here is the Dublin Voluntary Hospitals have a tiny number, health board hospitals significantly more, and then, of course, the Victoria in Cork, uh, where Edgar Ritchie's consultant kind of, you know, dwarfs everywhere else. I'm going to give you a second set of statistics on health boards by region. Um, they don't quite add up. Um, the second set underestimates the number done in Galway in the Western Health Board. So you've got the Eastern Health Board, Health Board Hospital, zero. The Southern, relatively low, but they have the Victoria. And you can go through it. The Western is Michael Mylott, who's doing them there. The Midwestern is Anto Dempsey, uh, and so forth. So you're getting very huge discrepancies in patterns, and the difference is where individual doctors have a strong, a, a, are strongly committed to doing something, and they, and they take a stand on it. That is not to say that in these hospitals it was particularly easy. I've heard reports from people of, a, of theatre staff walking out, of porters refusing to wheel patients, and a lot of other such activities. And when a private hospital in Galway came up for sale and the doctors in Galway were planning to buy it, uh, to run it themselves as a private clinic, Bishop of Galway, Eamon Casey, managed to insert a clause in the sale that prevented any tubal ligations being carried out in that hospital. Now, I need to come to a close at this stage and a couple of comments. First of all, many people in this audience know an awful lot more about this topic than I do. And I think it's very important that we capture their experience and, and we, we promote discussion about a, a, the extent to which practicing obstetrics or general practice has changed. And potentially the lessons I think that this particular phase in Irish medical history might inform us about other medical matters that we're dealing with today. I also think we need to acknowledge that the medical profession in Ireland played a, played a key role in the evolution of family planning, maybe more key, more critical role than elsewhere because of the absence through the censorship and everything of kind of voluntary groups that would take on these causes. A lot of it was done elsewhere by voluntary groups. Um, some, of, some doctors played admirable heroic roles, some others undoubtedly made the lives of their women patients much more difficult. We also need to recognize that the doctors in question were buffeted by both church and state and by new consumer demands from women patients. One aspect of the story is the absence of prominent women. I think this is particularly telling at a time when Cleena Murphy is about to become the first woman president of the Institute. Uh, a lot of women were involved with the Irish Family Planning Association, Well Women Clinic. They're there behind the scenes in other family plan clinics as well. They're not in the limelight. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that. And finally, my thanks to the following who gave up their time to tell me about their experiences. Some of you are in the audience, and it's great to have you here today. Thank you.